Hello there, Media Mail Gang. It is Katie with Katie Reads, and welcome or welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, hello, my name is Katie. I resell used books on multiple platforms like eBay and Etsy, and I talk about that on this channel. Uh, this series is going to be a little different, though. It is a deep dive into business-related items. And as someone who is a commercial lender for 12 years and has been in the reselling game for four years, I think it's important to, well, almost five years now, I think it's important to talk about certain things that are not talked about enough in the reselling community, especially from a business standpoint, because if you do want this to be something, even if it's part-time, if you do want this to be something that gets you substantial income and you want to be able to navigate this appropriately without having any issues or concerns or knowing if you're doing the right thing or not, having some very basic surface level information is very important. Now, this video, as I said, is going to be surface level. From here, you're going to have to seek professional help and support from an accountant, an attorney. You're going to have to do your own deep dive after that point of what you think might work best for you. Um, and again, every state is going to have different tax laws, different business structure laws. You may or may not need different licensing depending on the business entity structure that you choose to go with. Again, so just keep all of that in mind. This is meant to be very basic entry level to just help you understand what is out there. And then from there, whatever type you think might best fit your needs, you can pursue and then seek out professional help to make sure it is exactly what you want, what you need, what documents need to be filed, etc. So I just want to give that disclaimer. I am not a financial advisor, an attorney, an accountant, any of that. I'm just someone who has been in the banking industry for 12 plus years, was in the nonprofit industry, was in the educational tech industry for a while, um, and then dived into reselling over the past five years and has been doing it full time for about a year and a half. Um, so I just wanted to kind of share some information that I have and kind of talk about things that aren't talked about enough. So with all that rambling, uh, this series will be airing every Tuesday uh, in the afternoon. And my normal Monday, Wednesday, Friday videos will still keep happening. They'll be my thrifting videos, my research videos, my book info videos. That won't change. Um, this will just be a temporary series. <clears throat> Probably every other Tuesday, I'll be dropping a video in the afternoon going over some business-related information. Some of these may be long. Some of these may be shorter. It just depends on the topic that I decide to talk about. All right, so let's dive into it. Bring me down here to the screen, and we are going to um, essentially just, I'm going to dive into the business entity types. Again, like I said, surface level information. We'll talk about each one. And then at the end of this video, I'll give you some resources. And then I hope you just run with it from there and figure out what best suits your needs. Um, now, business entity types, you don't necessarily have to have all your ducks in a row to start your eBay account. You may need to have all your ducks in a row before you start your Amazon account. And you may need to have all your ducks in a row before you start your Etsy account. eBay so far is the only platform that I still know that okay with you starting off a certain way and then transitioning to a business type. Um, Amazon may allow you to still be a personal account and then change to a business site. I don't know for sure. So with that said, just be aware that you may have some hiccups if you start as like a personal under your own social and then you transition to something else. So just keep that in mind. All right. The first business entity type, and this is what I personally started off with, was a DBA, which stands for doing business as. This is typically something that you file with your county. Really the biggest and only reason I did it so I could have it on my bank account and so I could accept checks and payments made payable to that business name. Um, at the time, I think it was like book something. I can't remember what I had it as. The pros for this is you get a very simple, usually $10 to $25 document you can file with your local county. It's done. It's quick and easy. It's good for like, I want to say four to six years, again, depending on your county, your area. 
So it's good for a really long time and your bank will accept it and it'll allow you to take personal checks, business checks, um, get direct deposit under that business name. Like there's a lot of different things it will allow you to do. Everything still in theory reports to your social. It doesn't really make sense to have a tax ID number attached with the DBA. But again, I am not an accountant. Every situation could be different. The cons with the DBA is it is gone once the person who filed it and has ownership of it passes away. So it dissolves upon death. That's what the terminology we use a lot in the banking industry. It dissolves upon death, similar to like a POA, which dissolves upon death. Um, so it's something that you need to take into consideration. Now, with the DBA, you can have a partnership type where it's you and another individual, and you can actually dedicate that it is a partnership. In that case, you are both equally a part of the business. So if one of you passes away, the other person can still can still continue conducting transactions on that business account with your bank or continue to run the business or whatever that might look like. But again, if that person passes away, the business is dissolved. It's no more, you know, someone else brand new would have to either go through probate court or go to the county and try and rev revive it and um, do the necessary paperwork. So again, just kind of something to keep in mind. And then with DBAs, to my knowledge, um, you know, it's March 2024. So as far as my knowledge goes, there is no... Um, protection when it comes to liability with a DBA. It is essentially as if you are just operating under yourself. So if someone sues, they can take your assets, they can take, you know, everything. Um, again, I'm not an attorney, but that is my understanding of a DBA is it's pretty much like you're running, uh, everything's under your own social. So the liability coverage isn't really there. Next, we have an LLC or limited liability company. So limited liability, I can't really elaborate on like what's limited, what's not. Um, LLC is very, 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 very common. Almost everybody files an LLC because they think they have to. And you don't necessarily have to. Again, it depends on where you are in your reselling game, your tax structure, um, how you see funds being made on this account, you know, what risk you actually have. Everybody has a different appetite for risk and concerns of what they may or may not be sued for. So again, it just all really, really depends on how you're operating yourself. And again, why, why I will always say to seek out some legal support when making these decisions, but essentially a limited liability company, it helps protect you from certain situations where you may be sued. It also is typically the setting of where you will see people start getting tax ID numbers. They may have people on payroll. Sometimes you will also see LLCs as more of like what's referred to as the real estate holding company. So when you do a real estate acquisition, you may have the mortgage and deed and title work and all of that under an LLC. And then you are the operating entity, a separate LLC, and you actually pay rent to the LLC. And again, this is more of like an accounting purpose and, you know, protections. So if the operating entity gets sued, you don't lose, you know, the real estate. Again, it's just, that's a complicated example but it's not really relevant, you know, to an e-commerce business. But again, it just kind of shows like all the different ways that you can kind of unpack this and make it very um, unique to you in your situation. There's a lot of different structures out there and available. So for LLCs, they typically have what are called managers and members. Um, or you could have just all members. It just kind of depends. There is beneficial ownership. So if you are not a sole LLC member, in my case, I'm a sole LLC member of, you know, my LLC, for example, a beneficial ownership dictates how much of that business you own. And beneficial ownership is actually really important on a lot of federal levels because obviously there's a lot of scams, money laundering, things like that. So when I was in the banking industry, it was very important that we knew beneficial ownership of all LLCs that banked with us because we had to make sure that anyone that had a 25% or more interest in the business, we had to do a... Um, 
inquiry on them on the like terrorist list. Everyone had to be, you know, double checked. Um, and so that's kind of how uh, the banking industry will approach certain LLCs. They'll do some background checks, things like that. And if they ask you about beneficial ownership, that's what that means. Now, I know Casey Whoa. Rockstar Flipper recently did a video about how FinCEN um, is actually requiring people to file a beneficial ownership form now. So instead of the banking industry having you fill out their a form documenting everyone that has 25% or more ownership, you have to actually file. It's a one-time filing, assuming no changes. If there's changes, then you have to refile, but it's a one-time filing that you have to do. And it documents everyone that's part of that LLC. And this is actually a good thing. Someone that came from a banking industry, this is actually a really good thing because now it's more of a accessible database where everyone can kind of see who has ownership into what LLC it offers a lot more transparency with um, people that try to run scams and things like that. It kind of makes them a little bit more hesitant because a lot more information will be on a database structure. Now, I don't know what's going to be public information like Lara website, the licensing and regulatory affairs, that type of thing. But I think it will be accessible to, you know, people in the banking industry or, you know, maybe SBA lending, you know, things like that. Um, I can see where it could be used for that purpose. And I personally feel it's a good thing. It's a way to keep everybody clean and um, honest and on track with the structure of their business, especially the people that try to maybe scam or do uh, money laundering, things like that. It's a really good way to crack down on that because you would su be surprised how often that happens. Um, still today, people try and pull things. And it's just a really, really crazy. Um, I've seen a lot in my time. Let me just say that. I've seen a lot in my time. I've seen a lot of scammers trying to do a lot of messy things. Um, and I've seen a lot of divorces, a lot of breakups, a lot of uh, dissolving and ending of partnerships, relationships, things like that. And so it's just really good to have things crisp and clean and black and white on paper. So I do think it's a good thing now that beneficial ownership is going to be more on a database level, something that you record and, you know, you're one and done assuming, you know, if there's any changes or things like that. I also think it'll be good for, you know, when someone passes away, it'll help a lot to um, bypass the whole probate court thing and people that, you know, have an operating agreement, which I'll talk about next. Um, they can just kind of take over and continue with the business, refile, maybe some documentation they have to do. Again, these are all things that maybe an e-commerce business won't care about. You know, you're just a reseller on eBay. Why do I care about these things? But you never know where reselling can take you. I had no intention of having a YouTube channel. I had no intention of being an Amazon affiliate or an Amazon influencer. I had no intention of doing some of the things that I'm doing now that has um, evolved over the past five years. So you never know where things could head and lead. Um, and then maybe you are trying to take that deep dive and you are trying to have a brick and mortar and have a warehouse and a storage and you know, liability insurance, all those things matter. What happens if you are the key man of your business? What happens if you pass away? What does that look like? Who is going to continue with your business or at least make sure to wrap it up? You know, if you're okay with the ending with you, who can conduct things and wrap up things and close out your business account? These are all important things that you need to think about. So as far as an operating agreement, it's not something you have to have. It depends on how you're structured. If you have multiple people associated with your LLC, you should have an operating agreement. It just explains who can do what. If you Google operating agreement template, it'll give you a good idea of what it looks like. A lot of banks will ask for it. If you apply for a loan, you'll be asked for it. Um, it'll essentially say who can sign for lending, who can sign for accounts, who can do this, who can do that. Um, there's just a lot of basic um, logistical information regarding your LLC. Again, this is something if you have multiple people involved, if you are a one person, one man show with your LLC, sometimes again, it's referred to as sole proprietorship and that it gets a little gray. If you go to the IRS website, which I'll have in the link in the description of this video, the IRS considers a sole proprietorship, um, anything that is unincorporated. So uh, technically that could be a DBA. Technically that could be an LLC with one manager member. Um, so again, <laughs> just seek out some legal advice. That's really all I can say. 
seek out some legal advice, get some support. So as you're signing up for these different platforms, eBay, Amazon, Etsy, Mercari, whatnot, whatever you are applying to sell on, you can get an idea of what proper structure fits for your needs and what documentation and what type of way you should put that on. Um, so again, sometimes that's referred to as a sole proprietorship when it's a single manager member. Now with LLCs, you can get a tax ID number or um, an EIN number. They're kind of used synonymously, but it's very, very different. An EIN number is an employee identification number. That's something you have to do once you hit a certain amount of employees. Um, and then a tax ID number is just something separate from your social security number. It's strictly used for tax reporting purposes, tax returns um, to receive 1099s and whatever other miscellaneous tax documents you would get from a platform um, for documenting the funds that you made for the year. So that is a little different. Again, I'm not an accountant. You're going to want to refer to what best fits your needs. I'm going to be saying that a lot throughout this video. This is just basic, basic information that I want to share with you guys. And again, I am not a professional of anything related to being able to give actual advice on what best fits your needs, just explaining what these um, by definition kind of mean. Now, number three is a partnership. Again, kind of referring back to the whole um, DBA piece, partnerships can also just be filed completely on their own, typical to a DBA, but it's called a partnership and it's you and another person and you guys run the business synonymously together or maybe you run the business and this person is like your backup, whatever that structure looks like, but both of you equally have ownership liability to it. Like both of you are involved in this business. Um, partnerships are, I didn't see a lot of these. A lot of these are few and far between. Typically, instead of a partnership, I would see things like an LLC with multiple members. Next, we have incorporations or corporations. Um, incorporations and corporations run similar. Again, um, I saw these a lot, but more in a structure of it's multiple people involved in an incorporation and they have a building, they have a warehouse, they have employees, they have, you know, there's a lot going on with an incorporation and um, it's a very high level. You are, there's no liability for you personally. Like everything is in the corporation. The incorporation actually pays you like it's an actual payroll process. Very, very high level. I can't speak on a lot of the details of it. Again, you'd need to talk to an attorney professional. You do have to have a tax ID or and or employee identification number. Um, you are 100% going to have to file certain documents with your state and federally for this. You 100% will have a totally separate tax return. This will not be a Schedule C like an LLC on a personal tax return. This is going to be something filed totally separate. Um, there is a structure as far as C Corp or S Corp. Again, attorney. Attorney and accountant are going to have to tell you what matters with that and what doesn't. Um, it's best to draft this from start to finish with an attorney. I honestly would just pay for their time because to try and do it completely 100% on your own, unless you have a lot of experience and you're super comfortable with the legal jargon and this is just like your zone, it is very much, well, if it is, why are you watching this video? <laughs> but um, It is very high level um, and there's a lot of complications and details involved with this. I do know that if I personally were to set up an incorporation or corporation of any kind, I honestly would just sit down with an attorney and do it start to finish. Me personally, that would be my choice to each their own. Uh, the structure is typically president, vice president, treasurer, etc. It has titles very similar to what you would see on like a board type setting. Um, and there's stockholders. There can be stockholders, shareholders. Um, you can have, you know, you can be a publicly traded company and not publicly traded company. Like it gets pretty high level. Um, and it gets even more muddy and confusing if there's investors involved that have maybe a 5% shareholder of your business. Um, and then the owners have, you know, 40 and 50 or whatever, you know, it's just very, it can be very complicated. So again, incorporations, um, are very high level. And something that you would want to look at once you get to that point. And I know very, very few resellers that do this, but the few that I do know, um, 
they were making a lot of, you know, high level decisions, operational decisions. There was a lot of assets involved. There was employees involved. You know, sometimes your business just grows to that level and that's amazing. And you just, you know, adjust um, to the business entity type that you need. And finally, there's nonprofit. So um, some people have a nonprofit eBay store. Um, and nonprofit doesn't mean you can't make profit. It just means at the end of the year, you, you know, your, your balance sheet, your budget has to be zero. Um, so essentially, when it comes to nonprofits, you'd have to decide what that looks like on a state and federal level. Um, you know, your 501c3 you know, those things that make you a nonprofit and legal in the eyes of the state and the federal government, whatever that looks like. Um, if you run a nonprofit organization and this is something you want to do as a means of generating a sustainable source of revenue for your nonprofit, this could be an option. You know, I know a lot of Nonprofits run eBay stores. Um, nonprofits are on whatnot. I've seen many nonprofit bookstores on whatnot that have missions towards helping youth and things like that. Um, so it is out there. There are people out there doing reselling for their nonprofit. So it's definitely something you could look into. This very, very much would need an attorney or an accountant involved because nonprofits have a lot more rules and regulations that they have to follow. Um, and they're not required to pay certain tax that other businesses have to pay, you know, things like that. So again, just keep that in mind. Now, as far as licensing, um, wholesale licenses, uh, sales tax licenses, all of that, you'll want to talk with an accountant about that. It comes down to when you file your information and do all of that, you know, how, how are you going to acquire inventory? What is that going to look like? What type of reporting you're going to have to do? Unemployment insurance, just all those different things. Are you going to have to pay in or not pay in? Things like that. So again, I would talk with an accountant about all of that. And now as far as accounting, documentation, structural understanding, and legal support, those are the biggest things when it comes to deciding your business entity type. I really, really encourage you to do a deep dive research. So we've done the surface level here today. Today, you maybe got an idea of two or three things that might fit your needs. From here, why don't you take a deep dive into each of those things with further YouTube videos or further information you find or maybe you review the IRS website, SBA website, your local state, um, your local state's uh, licensing and regulatory affairs, figure out what they require, get more information, talk to your local bankers, figure out what type of information they would need for you to open up a business account. That's really the first step for a lot of resellers. You want to have that separate business account. Um, so take a deep dive with that. Then talk to an accountant. You should really be having some type of accounting advice. Even if you do your own taxes, you really should have someone on speed dial that you can talk to with detailed questions. Maybe you pay them, you know, per half hour that you use their time or per email you do back and forth, whatever that charge might look like. But I definitely recommend having someone um, on your team with those details. That is it, you guys. That is the overall structure of business entity types that I have personal knowledge of. If I miss anything, if you feel that I did anything wrong, you can definitely drop a comment in the video. But this is based on my many years of experience, basic knowledge that I know, based off the IRS website, again, that will be in the description of this video. Um, and essentially, this is just meant to be kind of like really more podcast style and just basic information for you guys to kind of learn and grow from and decide from here the surface level information that you should dive into further. So I'm curious, drop a comment. Let me know if you like this style, if this adds value for you, if this is helpful. Um, I feel like these videos will reach a lot more people and especially people trying to get into reselling in 2024. So if you are brand new to me and my channel, um, this is not my typical Monday, Wednesday, Friday content. This is just a mini series that I'm doing to kind of provide more value to my current followers and potential new followers. So uh, if you like this type of content, if you're interested in reselling books, give me a follow. I will talk about that a lot on this channel. And thank you guys so much for watching and we'll see you in the next video.